Hello, Fuel Milwaukee. Come on in the room. I see you all coming in. Thank you so much for being here for today's Race Bridge conversation. Those of you who are Fuel members or who have been to our Race Bridge conversations before know that we've been doing this for a while, um, once a week, every Thursday. So you can go ahead and put them on your calendar for the rest of September every Thursday from 2 to P, I'm sorry, from 2 to 3 p.m. We're live having different conversations about race, racial equity, and hopefully sharing information and perspectives that help bridge people uh, together rather than the divide that we've often experienced. So I'm so excited to have a conversation today about segregation in Milwaukee. Our topic today is hyper segregation. It's something that we've all heard about. Um, something that we probably all think about, something that we all live as we drive through our beautiful city and um, probably subconsciously or for some of us a little bit more loudly wonder why are we so separated? Why are we so divided? And today we're really going to explore that and get into it here. Um, I am so happy to have these amazing panelists that you see here um, on the side and hopefully you guys are going to use the gallery view so you can see us all at once when I'm not sharing. But our panelists today are Reggie Jackson, who is an educator, author, uh, consultant, historian. He's been doing a lot of work for many, many years uh, around race education, diversity, equity, uh, just a, a, a historian that people have come to uh, love and trust and see as a huge resource. Hi, Reggie. Hey, Corey Zero. Good to be here with you. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to have you. Uh, some of you know already, because I've mentioned it before, but Reggie and I met years, years, years ago. We were both whippersnappers uh, <laughs> at the Black Holocaust Museum, America's Black Holocaust Museum, which was founded by um, somebody we both love, Dr. James Cameron. Reggie was the head grill at the museum while, um, while I was working there. And so that's our uh, connection. He now is uh, a consultant with his own company, Nurturing Diversity Partners, and he'll talk to you all a little bit about that. Our other panelist is Joshua Garoon. He's the assistant professor uh, in the Department of Community and Environmental Sociology at UW-Madison. Hey, Josh. Glad to hey, have you. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, okay, so we're gonna get back to them in a second. You know, I gotta, I gotta go through my slides and thank my sponsors. We wouldn't be able to do this without uh, wonderful sponsors like our media sponsor, Radio Milwaukee. Because of Radio Milwaukee, lots of folks know about the Race Bridge conversations and what we're doing. They've been spreading the word and we're doing our best to spread the word about them. I love Radio Milwaukee because to me, you've heard me say it before, it's one of the most listenable stations. Um, I, no matter what time of day I turn it on, even if I don't know the artist, it's always a groove. It's always a bop. And I love their music so much. But it's not just the music. When you go to their website, we got a screenshot here. They have tons of stories and resources and interviews and uh, podcasts. They do so much about Milwaukee and what makes Milwaukee a distinct and special place in the world. This is one of the go-to spots in Milwaukee for good news and, and good stories and to, to find out what's going on in the world um, and how, how Milwaukee plays a part in all of that. So thanks again to Radio Milwaukee for your support. So just kicking off the conversation today, you all are here because we wanted to talk about segregation and how does Milwaukee consistently land in the top 10 at the number one spot for many years, we would say the top 10, but now we've been in the number one spot for a while around segregation. How do we become the most segregated? Um, just visually, I'll kind of show you some pictures of these maps that give a striking uh, sort of visual around what segregation means. Uh, Reggie and Josh are going to give us a little bit more context, but I just kind of wanted to share these to, to get us going so you can understand why this is such an important um, topic and what it really feels like. Now, if you've been in Milwaukee for any time and you lived in Milwaukee for any period of time, these maps won't come as a surprise to you because you've driven around and you've seen that seen it happen where you go through and it's a completely white neighborhood and keep keep going keep going there's a completely black neighborhood keep going keep going there's all hispanic people keep going keep going you just notice it 
Um, I think it might be especially noticeable for people who aren't from Milwaukee originally. As a native, I think sometimes we get used to it. When folks aren't from Milwaukee originally, I think it's a stark contrast and people are wondering, how come folks aren't coming together more in our city? Reggie, how do you respond to that? What's up with this segregation in Milwaukee? Well, you know, I, I tell people that seg segregation is not something that they think it is, that it's much more than just residential segregation, it's segregation of minds and hearts also. And a big part of that is because we live in seg segregated spaces. We don't get to know people from other groups and we make assumptions about people based on stereotypes of them. So, you know, part of what I wanna to share today is just a little bit of the history of segregation, particularly looking at Milwaukee and how it developed. So if I could go ahead and share my screen. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'll go ahead and just kind of talk to you all about uh, what happened to Milwaukee and, and how it became this very segregated place, right? So, um, my company is called Nursing Diversity Partners. Uh, it's a small firm. We do diversity, equity, inclusion training around the country. Most of our work is here in Wisconsin. Uh, we've been in 35 different communities in Wisconsin throughout the last three years, uh, as far north as uh, Wausau, La Crosse, uh, out west, and Platteville, Burlington. We've been all over the place. Uh, and so what I want to share with you all is what hypersegregation means. Th this is from one of the you know, the foremost experts on history of segregation, Douglas Massey, he says that non-white residents are unevenly distributed geographically. Uh, and that means that, you know, you, you can look at a place and you can see the geographical region and you can see that clearly um, people live in separate spaces uh, and they're usually isolated uh, and their neighborhoods are clustered together in certain parts of town. So you know where those particular places are. And then um, they're, they're concentrated in these really compact areas. Uh, and they're usually in the urban core of a city. So let's kind of look at what that looks like. This is a racial dot map of metropolitan Milwaukee area. Uh, and inside this kind of purple border you see, that's the city of Milwaukee. The orange dots represent where white people live. The green dots are where black people live. The blue dots are where Hispanics live. And then there's other dots that represent other groups, but there's just a small number, you can't really recognize them. But what I, the reason I want to show you this was to also show you that in 1938, uh, the redlining map, which were officially called residential security maps was drawn for Milwaukee. And this area here, area D5, that's where literally every black person in Milwaukee lived inside that little box, right? And then this area here, D11 on the south side, that's literally where every Mexican person in Milwaukee lived. They were the only Hispanics in town at that time. So those areas are red line. You couldn't get out of those spaces if you were black or Latino. And as you can see, this area that was all black, uh, well, it was actually a very mixed neighborhood, Blacks uh, as well as more recent Jewish immigrants, but that's where every Black person lived, and that's right here. It's in the same spot where the Mexicans lived back in 1938. Well, guess what? It's the same area, so they haven't moved out of those areas uh, in many respects, but this, this is a, a, a clear image to show you how segregated the four-county area is. So the green dots here represent where Blacks live, in the four county area, the blue dots represent where uh, Hispanics live. And it's very clear to see that there are not a whole lot of black folks outside the city of Milwaukee, particularly outside the north uh, and northwest side of the city. Uh, most of the Hispanics here are still concentrated on the south side of the city of Milwaukee. There's a growing number of Hispanics that have moved out you know, further west into Waukesha. But it, it, it's very similar to what you saw back in 1938. So let's look at what the, the metro area looks like. This is Milwaukee. Milwaukee is a very diverse city. People are surprised to see that, you know, uh, it's as diverse as it is. It's the most diverse city in the state of Wisconsin. About 36% of the residents are non-Hispanic whites, about 39% non-Hispanic Blacks, 4% non-Hispanic Asians, 18.5% Latinos, and a little bit less than one half of 1% Native American. And, and I, I have to let people know, non-Hispanic whites People don't understand that Hispanic slash Latino is not a racial group, it's an ethnic group. You can be Black and Hispanic, you can be White and Hispanic, you can be Native American and Hispanic, you can be Asian and Hispanic. So I wanted to separate those out because oftentimes when people show data about the demographics of Milwaukee, they don't separate it out in this way. Uh, so many, most Hispanics in, in the country are of the white racial group. So it's, it's important to separate the two. But now if you look at, at the suburbs, those 18 other cities in Milwaukee County, 
uh, outside the city of Milwaukee, and you can see that almost 80% of the residents in those 18 other cities are white. And when you go out to the wild counties, uh, Waukesha County, 89% of the residents are white. Uh, and then when you go out even further to Ozaukee County, 92% of the residents are white. And then Washington County, 93% of the residents are white. So it's very clear to see a very, very, very diverse city surrounded by communities that have little to no racial diversity. And that's not accidental. It happened on purpose. If you look here, these are all of the cities within Milwaukee County, right? And this is a white percentage in this first column. And as you can see, a majority of them are in the 80s, right? And, and if you look, there's only a few places that have a uh, percentage of people of color, either black or Hispanic, that's above 10%. So River Hills does, Glendale does, Brown Deer does, West Milwaukee, um, you know, uh, West Milwaukee is probably, I would say, the most diverse place because it has a, a pretty hefty percentage of uh, Blacks and Hispanics there. Uh, Brown Deer is shifting. 70% um, of the kids in the school district now are students of color. So you see that most of the places around us are very, very, very white, and they have been for a long time. So the thing that separates Milwaukee, though, from other highly segregated communities like Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Buffalo, is that when you look at Blacks who live outside the central city, so Blacks who live in Milwaukee County, but don't live in the city of Milwaukee, only seven and a half percent of Blacks in Milwaukee County live outside the city of Milwaukee. And you can see the numbers are significantly higher in Buffalo, Detroit, Chicago, and Cleveland. So when you go to the burbs in these places, you're pretty likely to have a pretty good chance of seeing some Black folks. But when you go to the burbs around Milwaukee, that's just not going to happen very often, right? So that's what makes Milwaukee stand out. And, and you know, there's multiple ways to measure uh, segregation. But to me, I, I don't really care about those measures as much as I care about the fact that we have the lowest percentage of Blacks in the suburbs of any of these highly segregated communities. And, and so uh, these things happen intensely. Uh, Arnold Hirsch, uh, who passed a couple of years ago, one of the foremost experts on history of segregation, wrote in a paper that a conscious deliberate choice of segregation lay at the heart of national policy. This is a sign that was out in Tulsa, all over Tulsa, letting people know that there was restricted zoning in Tulsa. And what that meant was that only white people could live in Walmart, Tulsa. And these were legally binding uh, racial restrictive covenants, which you'll hear uh, a little bit about soon. Uh, but these were done very intentionally. People kept people of color out, particularly Blacks, uh, and they did it very intentionally. So there's a group at the University of Minnesota that's done research on segregation in Hennepin County, Minnesota, and they are attempting to map all of the racial restrictive covenants in that community. Um, I've, I've connected with that group. We're collaborating on doing the same thing here in Milwaukee County, but the, lo the local PBS station did a documentary about their work called Jim Crow the North. I want you to, um, to see a part. It's actually I have to stop sharing and go back because when I shared, I forgot to share the sound. Uh, okay. Let me go back real quick. Um, so well, I want to make sure that I share the sound. Yeah. yeah, as you're doing that, I will um, ask folks. To say, I see some people commenting in the in the chat, agreeing with what okay. you're saying. So right now we have uh, 350 something participants. The participants that are listening with us live, and the ones that are on Facebook, go in the comments and let us know if these maps surprise you. Does it ring true for you that Milwaukee is segregated as you're driving through our community? Do you see it? Do you feel it? I just kind of would like to kind of get your uh, feedback and you can do that in the chat right now. Go ahead, Reggie. Okay, so I'll show you this quick uh, about five minute video and then I'll talk more specifically about how these covenants uh, were used in Milwaukee. Uh, And this is where you first see this racial language. Caucasians only, Aryans only, no Negroes or no members of African blood or descent. 100% of them were aimed at black people. In many ways, racial covenants, this is kind of ground zero of residential segregation. In the United States, and racism have a very, very long history, but this particular deployment of racism is fairly new, and this idea was really made material through instruments like racial covenants. The law of the street, the law of the courts working 
in consort to discourage blacks from moving into white neighborhoods. It starts out as private property developers, but eventually you have the federal government encouraging these racial covenants, demanding actually that any investment they make is protected with this kind of racial exclusivity. When you can covenant entire areas of the city, it makes it off limits. That's pretty powerful. the Supreme Court even held that restrictive covenants were constitutional. This was in the case of Corrigan v. Buckley, and it was in that decision where the court resolved that restrictive covenants are contracts, and as such, they are lawful. Now forget about the fact that they discriminate, and forget about the fact that once we say these contracts exist, we are, we are bringing up a violation issue of the 14th Amendment. Forget about that. The key thing is that the Supreme Court validated segregation, validated discrimination. You have the full force of the law, the court system, um, determining who could go where. And what will happen as a result of that is you'll see efforts to ensure that a denial to one of the most basic foundations of, of opportunity for African Americans will be codified in the United States as a result you had not only the courts supporting it, but also a kind of license of sorts of people going to the streets and harassing blacks who moved into white neighborhoods. And this is where the term redlining comes into place. The FHA, they made color-coded maps of all the largest cities in the United States, and they broke cities down into four different areas. Red is considered hazardous, that's the worst. Yellow is considered definitely declining, blue is considered still desirable, and green is considered the best. And what's so powerful about this kind of scale of measuring investment, it was about values and people. The fact of the matter is that there was no evidence that those people who lived in those communities, pre predominantly black and brown people and foreign-born people, would have defaulted on loans. The FHA is being very upfront and very explicit in how they're linking spatial desirability with racial occupancy. It's this racialization of space idea. So areas that were predominantly uh, African American or majority minority or really in a lot of cases, even if there's a few non-white people there, that's often enough to be redlined. So when they built these maps, they also explained why each area got the ranking it did. This one part of South Minneapolis was redlined specifically due to, and I'm quoting, a gradual infiltration of Negroes and Asiatics. FHA refused to give an area a green line designation. Again, this is the best designation that they'll, they'll offer unless, and I'm quoting again, restrictive covenants are already in place. That line's from the FHA underwriting manual. Racial covenants aren't just about discriminating against people of color. It's about enriching white people. And I think that's the part that often gets lost in this narrative. In a lot of ways, the practice of redlining, which didn't start until the 1930s, institutionalized and spread racial covenants all over the country because suddenly developers got sanctioned, they got direction from the federal government saying, this is best practices if you want to have a really high rating from us, if you want to get the most favorable terms for any loans. So if somebody sells a covenant at home to an African American, the neighbors can sue that person because their property values are now lower. If I have a covenant at home and I sell it to somebody who isn't white and I get sued, I lose the house. Any equity I've accumulated, the property reverts to the initial granting party, so whoever first put that covenant on the land. If that person's dead, I would revert to that the heirs or assigns of the initial covenanting party. So the risk of going against these things is just like astronomical. So let, let's look very quickly at how they were used here in uh, Milwaukee County. Now they were used all over the city of Milwaukee, but looking at the 18 suburbs of Milwaukee, 16 of the 18 uh, used these covenants. Uh, Walwood Sosa had more than any other uh, of our suburbs. And, and this report from the Metropolitan Integration Research Center showed that Bayside, Fox Point, Glendale, Greenfield, Hales Corn, St. Francis, South Milwaukee, all specifically excluded blacks in the language of the covenants that they wrote. Cudahy, Shorewood, West Milwaukee, Whitefish Bay, Walworth, Tulsa restrictions on any non-Caucasian people. And I want to show you examples of two of these so you can see what they actually said. And these are legally binding. 
Uh, if you violated them, you would lose your home. This one written in Fox Point, a subdivision there, written in 1939, set to expire in 1965, said that no part of said premises shall be owned or occupied by any person other than of the Caucasian race, provided, however, that this covenant shall not prevent occupancy by domestic servants of a different race or nationality employed by an owner or tenant. And here's another one. Uh, this is my favorite. This is from South Milwaukee, written in 1937, set to expire January 2024. At no time shall any such lot or any building thereon be purchased, owned, leased, occupied, or used by any per person other than citizens of the United States of America of the white race. This provision shall not apply to domestic servants, which may be employed by the owner or occupant of any such lot or building thereon. So that gives you an idea of kind of how this played out here in Milwaukee, a um, little bit of the history of it. And uh, that, that's, that's what I wanted to share with everyone. That was really impactful. We got a lot of comments in the, in the chat of folks wondering, um, Reggie, is that, a, is that video somewhere on YouTube where people can find it? Is it a yeah, yeah, all they have to do is Google Jim Crow of the North. Now those covenants, one thing I have to mention about the covenants, there's, there's two things you have to know about them. Uh, in 1948, a case called Shelley v. Kramer, the US Supreme Court ruled that they could no longer be legally enforced, which meant that the authorities couldn't come and remove people. But guess what? People pretty much ignored the Supreme Court like they usually did, right? Uh, people continued to write those covenants. Uh, the 1968 Federal Fair Housing Act made them completely um, unconstitutional. Uh, but the thing about it is that they were in force for so long that they created all white spaces that continue to be all white or mostly white even to this day. You, you can't shift you know, decades and decades of all white spaces into spaces that are diverse overnight. And, and I always say this as I talk about this topic to people, like, listen, people ask me, what's the solution to segregation in Milwaukee is? I'm like, well, if you think the solution is a bunch of Black people packing up and moving to the suburbs, that's just not going to happen. Uh, black people in Milwaukee who have enough money to live in the suburbs, families making six figures or higher, we're much more likely to live in a high poverty neighborhood in Milwaukee than we are in any other city. And why do we stay? Well, because uh, the sub suburbs have proven to us that they're not welcoming places. Uh, our kids get mistreated at the schools out there. We get followed around the mall when we go shopping out there. The police racially profile us out there. And plus, many of us, like my wife and I, we love the city of Milwaukee. We love living right in the heart of the city of Milwaukee. We're 15, 20 minutes away from everything we want to do. We don't have to get on the freeway to go anyplace. We love it in the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so Reggie, I share with you and Josh, we'll bring you into the conversation, my own, own experience. I'm going to talk about this on September 17th. I'm doing a webinar, Fuel is in partnership with um, Black Lands through Milwaukee F Film, uh, where we're talking about housing. And Reggie, what you described is exactly the situation that I've been in. I have just moved to Whitefish Bay this weekend because I was living um, on 20th and Walnut, very close to downtown, um, almost 100% Black neighborhood. And because of the unemployment and COVID and just uh, this summer has been really violent and rough in our, in our neighborhood, a bullet came through our uh, house and almost hit both kids. They saw it go past their face and thought it was a rock. Um, that's the only reason why um, I moved because I know that I've lived in Whitefish Bay before and I know what, I know those stairs, I know those looks, you know, I know that um, what that experience is for uh, kids in that school district and I just have not wanted to expose my, my kids to that, but you know, I guess it's better that than um, than violence and bullets coming coming to your house, but that's the choice that you have to make when your yeah. city is segregated. There's no, there's a couple of neighborhoods, you know. With, oh, you can go to Bayview, and you can, you know. There's a couple where we, you say it's River, you know, River West. It's you can go there, but it's rough and it, and, and it's difficult. Josh, what from a sociologist perspective, we talk about the the, the setup of segregation and how it was kind of put into place with these covenants. What is, how did that play out in people's lives now today? I saw some comments of like, why is this still happening? From your perspective, uh, how does that affect, how has it, this affected us as a community? Sure. 
Sure. So, you know, Reggie just gave, gave a, lot of, a lot of great details on, on why there's this persistence. And in a second, I'm going to share the screen and sort of give you, using maps Reggie's already showed you, I'm going to give you a, a pretty dramatic view of how this persists. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, so from a sociological perspective, and I love the fact that Reggie mentioned Doug Massey, whose book was titled, uh, the classic book was titled American Apartheid, because that's really, that, that, that's what a sociologist looked and saw in the history. Uh, and people tend to resist the, the idea that this is still going on today. And part of it is absolutely the communities that Black people have built in Milwaukee, uh, the homes they've made, the neighbors they've made, the families, the connections. But part of it is also that not only the city of Milwaukee, not only the county, the surrounding counties, not only the state of Wisconsin, but the country as a whole uh, has in a de facto, not a de jure. So, so by fact, not by law, continued many of the policies that were started really in the era of redlining. So I'm, I'm just gonna show a real quick map to, to set the basis for this. Um, let me go ahead and do this here. And this is a map that my colleagues in the Applied Population Laboratory, uh, which is housed in our department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison put together. So you've seen this already. This is the redlining map, 1938. This is the maps that the video talked about. And here's the slider. Keep in mind that the red areas are the, the areas that were declared uh, not good investments for banks. So I'm going to slowly start sliding this. And this is the 2010, uh, 2018 racial dot map. And again, one dot is 25 people. Green is that turquoise is, is black people. The red is, is, is Latinx, Hispanic people. The blue is Asian. That light purple is white. Okay. So just, I, I want you to pay attention to what happens to these red and yellow areas as I do this. Okay, look at the shore, and then look as we get into these yellow and red areas, what's happening here. If you don't see that and think, wow, there, there is persistence over 1938 to 2000, that's 80 years of Milwaukee history. If you don't see how those areas are lighting up on that map, I don't know what to tell you. I, I honestly don't. They, it's not a perfect match because some areas got completely paved over. And those areas were often preferentially places where Black people and Latin, Latinx people, Hispanic people, sometimes Jews, sometimes Italians, sometimes Irish people in Wisconsin. That's the story of Madison, where Milwaukee lived. So what does that mean? It's not just that people were concentrated in space. It's that investments from the local government level all the way up to the federal level from local infrastructure all the way up to highways, interstate highways, were constructed either away from the redlined areas and the, heavily, the areas heavily populated by particularly black people in places like Milwaukee or in Milwaukee and places like Baltimore, highways were built straight through them, including highways to nowhere. There's a famous one in Baltimore that literally just goes nowhere, but it was built straight through a black neighborhood because they could. And then they didn't do anything with it. And to day, this day, it goes nowhere. So, that was when you know the maps were were legal the covenants were legal but even as these things have become illegal you can no longer do this in the de jure fact, uh, uh, way federal state and local money still pour in to predominantly white neighborhoods and those are neighborhoods that were determined 80 years ago that still reap the benefits of that right and the suburbs were basically built for that purpose and what you see over time is suburbs and even parts of Milwaukee County itself, when do their populations explode? Well, coincidentally, a lot of the populations explode in 1954. You start scratching your head and think, well, what happened in 1954? And for those of you who know history, this isn't hard. It's Brown versus Board of Education. And suddenly, white people start looking around and saying, oh, my school's going to be integrated. It's no longer OK by law for my kids not to have to go to school with, with their kids. And you see in, in city after city, this white flight, the flight to the suburbs, and the money follows them. The property values follow them. As property taxes collapse in places like the core of Milwaukee, not only does it impoverish the people, but of course schools are paid for largely out of local property taxes. So the tax base gets undercut. So education gets undercut. And my specialty is, is health. And that's really what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to turn to a little bit here, but I want to show you just a couple of other maps um, while I'm doing this. This is another sort of dot map, uh, and this is a job dot map. All right, and this is this is work that 
uh, a, a grad student of mine, Leah Fultman, put together for Milwaukee. And the orange is, I know you can't read the legend, I apologize, we're working on this, but the orange is manufacturing, okay? And the blue is professional. And what I want you to see here is that jobs are also segregated. And that's not by accident either. Manufacturing areas tend to be put where either there aren't many people or where no one cares about the people who are living there in terms of the effects, quite frankly. I'm just gonna be blunt. And so you get these environmental injustices as well, where heavy manufacturing or heavier, ma heavier manufacturing in the city is located in neighborhoods where people don't have the political power, the financial power to fight back. And you also have des more desirable jobs that tend to move, move away from those neighborhoods. So you just, everything, but that's not by law, right? It's that there aren't laws protecting those neighborhoods from the heavier industry, from the bus depots, from the factories, right? There should be probably better environmental protection because it's not great for your health to live right next to a bus depot 24 seven. And there's no law making any corporation, you know, corporations can locate where they want to. So what you see is that when, I think Glendale was mentioned earlier, and there's an interesting thing going on here where you can actually see uh, the mall that at the time Glendale tried to attract manufacturing, manufacturing and that's what's going on here. You see that this is a manufacturing sector right here in the middle and all these car, uh, uh, all, all the car uh, dealerships are, are sort of around there, around the old railroad line. Uh, what's interesting to me is an awful lot of them are upper range car dealerships now, right? There, you, you get the Lexus dealership there and stuff. So you, you see over time this persistence wealth advantage that just ramifies. Not again in this point by law. And everybody's like, oh, but didn't they make that illegal? Sure. But once the advantage is cemented, the investment continues to pour in to the wealthier, wider neighborhoods. And the disinvestment continues throughout blacker neighborhoods and neighborhoods that are more, that are more Latinx. And, and Reggie's exactly right. What you also see is that relative to white neighborhoods and especially to wealthy white neighborhoods, even wealthier black people on average live in much less wealthy neighborhoods throughout the country and especially in Milwaukee. And part of that is for exactly the reasons Reggie mentioned, but part of it is also things like steering, which is illegal. A broker is not supposed to take a black family and say, oh, I think you wanna live in this neighborhood, not that neighborhood. But there have been multiple exposés over the last several years showing that this still happens. So part of what I ask as a guy who does public health is why does that matter? And it matters because of reports, if I can get to it, like this one. Hold on, let me drag this down just a little bit. I apologize for not having slides, but it's easier for me to do this. Yeah, it's, it's, I like to do it like that too. <laughs> So it, it's, it's, it's stuff like this, right? It's stuff like this. It's stuff like this. The Health Compass from Milwaukee report that shows, and you just, you go through these things over and over again and you see repeatedly in Milwaukee neighborhood after Milwaukee neighborhood, the impact of segregation on health. And that this is really, this is, this is what I say. And, and you see it in things like infant mortality. And look, there are still questions about why infant mortality, for example, is so high in places like Milwaukee. In 2018, Wisconsin as a state had the highest infant mortality gaps between black mothers and white mothers in the country, in the entire country. Now, you know, I know there's some question about measures of segregation, about how we measure hypersegregation. I understand all of that, that, that those are all good questions. It is very hard to argue with statistics that show that two years ago, the state with the highest gap, and in fact, overall highest, some of the highest rates of, of infant mortality among, among uh, black families, period, were Wisconsin, and that's heavily driven by Milwaukee, by Madison, by Kenosha, by Racine, by Oshkosh, all five of which, by the way, were redlined. Milwaukee wasn't the only city in Wisconsin that was redlined. All five of those cities were redlined. And so these, these persistent effects over time, you know, nothing's happening to most of these babies the moment they're born. There's nothing about being a black baby that should mean black babies wind up dying at that rate. It's persistence. 
it's the fact that the mothers have been affected by segregation and by all of the things I just talked about, by the socioeconomic status, by jobs, by where their homes are located, by the flight of resources, by education, all, all of those socioeconomic determinants that I just mentioned, fleeing parts of Milwaukee where more black people and more Latinx people live and more, more white people live, even if no one's necessarily even doing that intentionally in the sense that, well, I don't like black people, so I'm gonna move my business to wherever. That, that is, and there have been studies, this is not how most businesses operate. The businesses say, I want money and I want a demographic where I know I'm gonna make money. And so I'm gonna chase that white wealthy demographic because that's where I can think money. That, that's where I can make money. Is that racist? Yes. Is that active, I don't like black people racism? Maybe in some cases it is, but in a lot of cases, the owners, look, if I could make money in, you know, among wealthy black people, and, and you see this in, in Maryland, where Prince George's County has a healthy black middle-class neighborhood you know, and more, multiple black neighborhoods, and you see thriving businesses there, like you don't in other neighborhoods. There's still racism there. There's still a lot of problems in Maryland, as if you follow the news, you know. But when you compare a city like Baltimore, a city like Milwaukee to those counties, you can see that race is hugely determinative, not only of the act of racism, which is obviously still with us, you just again have to follow the news, but the continuing patterns of segregation reproduce themselves even when people don't really mean to. And that's because unless you take active steps to desegregate and to repair that history, the stuff doesn't start changing. This is exactly what Reggie was saying. It takes generations to undo. And over that time, the generational damage that gets done is what gives you headlines like this, where health officials and faith leaders and, and everyday people are thinking, we have worked so hard on this. Why are we not having the effect that we would like to see? And the answer is, Milwaukee is not in a vacuum. It's not in a bubble. What happens in the counties? what happens in the state and what happens in the country all winds up continuing these patterns of segregation that then continue these patterns of ill health. I just wanna show one more map and I'm gonna be quiet. This is uh, the rate, as you can see, per 100,000 people of cases by county right now, as best the Wisconsin Department of Health Services can give you. And what you're gonna see here is it, the, the, the dark blue is where the highest uh, cases per 100,000 are. So this is adjusted for population. This isn't just number of cases. This is per 100,000 people uh, living in the census tract. And what we've seen over time, I wish I could go back and bring up the maps from early in the pandemic, because if I showed you this early in the pandemic, you would have seen, oh, D5, that old redlining map, yep, right there. Cases were just, that was blowing up blue. Now, over time, there's been a shift. And what you're seeing more and more is it in the Latinx communities you're seeing this blowing up of COVID-19 rates. Well, why is that? It's not because there's anything special about Latinx people that makes them more susceptible. There's nothing genetic, there's nothing biological. It's nothing like that. It's where they work. It's how they are exposed in the places they work and it's how they live. In denser neighborhoods, with often multiple generations in the family. That's because of how people immigrated. It's because of how the networks work. It's also because of poverty. And it's because of the location of the jobs and how all of this stuff goes together. And again, that, goes, that starts, sure, at the city level, but it goes all the way up to the federal policies on immigration. It goes all the way up to federal policies that refuse to consider reparations for black people and that continue to disinvest and to allow the private sector to disinvest and to allow schools to be funded by property taxes and thus underfunded by property taxes. And any health outcome you look at, you will never find a health outcome in the United States that is not fundamentally influenced heavily by things like education, by things like where you live, by your environmental exposures, by the stress and other things that you go under job. Commuting time is huge. Like the more you have to commute, it's stress. Anybody who's commuted knows this. So if there's no public transportation because there's been disinvestment in transportation, if you live in Milwaukee and suddenly you have to go to Northern Illinois or Chicago for your job or elsewhere for your job, well, yeah, that's something about Milwaukee. But if the governor of your state also decided he didn't want to invest in public transportation infrastructure and you don't have a car or gas is expensive or insurance is expensive or half a dozen other things are going on, 
you wind up seeing the health effects of that. And, you know, so this is, I, I point all this out to not, not to, Reggie told you a lot of this already, but what I really want to drive home is the everyday effects this has on individual people that build into these populations. And that then the news often takes and says, oh, COVID among African-American people, COVID among Latinx people, and people run with the, oh, they must be doing something wrong. They must be behaving. Poor. No, 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 no. Look, when you are put into these segregated spaces, and, and I love what Reggie said about it, not just being residential segregation, it's activity segregation. It's economic segregation, it's job, it's employment segregation, it's educational segregation, it's green space and where it's located through cities like Milwaukee. When you put all of that together, what do you expect to see? What COVID-19 did was not suddenly make lots of people of color unhealthy. It exposed what we had done as a country and as a state and as a county and as a city not just in Milwaukee, but in place after place after place, what we had already done to those people's health. And then you introduce something like COVID-19, which absolutely capitalizes on existing health issues that people have, whether it's because they're older, whether it's because they have heart disease or lung disease, whatever it is, it capitalizes on that. And it exposes, it shines a big, white, hot spotlight on what's going on already in those communities. And to blame those people in those communities for that is perverse. There's no other word for it. It's absolutely perverse. And that's where I'll hang it up and, and let us get into some Q&A and, and hand it back to you and Reggie. Can I, can I share something real quick? Yeah, Just ready to what, what you shared, Josh, that's, that's brilliant. Um, one thing I, I want people to understand, uh, every day, Monday through Friday, 66,000 white people live in our suburbs and exurbs driving to Milwaukee to work. At the same time, 33,000 Blacks leave the city to go to the burbs to work. 9,000 Hispanics go out to the suburbs to work. And as a result of that, I want to share with you one last slide just to show you how important these things are because I don't think that many people know this. Um, so if you look at this, this is the percentage of residents, right? This is the percentage of workers. Whites are 36% of the population in the city of Milwaukee, but they have 72% of the jobs in the city. Blacks are 39% of the population, but only have 21% of the jobs. Uh, Latinx people, 18.5% of the population, but have less than 10% of the jobs. Those things, I think, are critical for us to understand when we come to Milwaukee and we see the condition of certain communities, well, that's part of the reason. You know, when I shared those, that data with, with, with uh, the mayor of Milwaukee once, he's like, oh my goodness, Reggie, I can't believe that. I didn't know that. And I was like, Mr. Mayor, you need to hire some better people to work for you because you should know this stuff, right? Those are things, and, and, and I don't know if Josh is aware of this. I saw somebody typed it in chat. Hospitals in Milwaukee have closed during the course of my life. Um, you know, we, we lost St. Michael's Hospital, which is on the north side in the black neighborhood. Uh, we lost Northwest General Hospital, which is where my wife was born, in a Black neighborhood in Milwaukee. You don't have hospitals that close in white neighborhoods, right? It doesn't happen. We almost lost St. Joseph's, which is six blocks from my house. And if it wasn't for the community rallying, that hospital would have closed also. And that hospital, more babies are born in that hospital than any other hospital <laughs> in the metro area, right? So Corey George, boy, she's probably born there, right? So. And, my, and my two kids. <laughs> yeah. Can I show one more slide just that speaks to this point beautifully? Yeah. Let, me, let me just show one more. Uh, so Josh, this is another map. Up, as you're setting it up and getting the slide, you can actually put it up. I'm going to ask people to kind of go in the chat right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah please. This will be real quick. You're this is one more map my grad student, Leah Fultman, put together. Yeah. And the, the dark brown is, I mean, you've already seen this, right? This is, this is the, the colors of the, of the census tracts are, are racial density, percent black. So the lighter pink is, is very low level density of black people, brown is, right? These are COVID testing sites. Community is the circle. H is like healthcare, hospitals, clinics, things like that. Community is, is just community sites and the, the brown plus is pharmacies. Look at the circle around these neighborhoods, right? Uh, we don't know exactly how these decisions were made. We're looking into this. But what you see is exactly, it, it, it's, again, it's this expansion out of, of neighborhoods as investments, as disinvestment happens, right? 
And there's a problem there, right? Because then when you hit a point like this, the hospitals aren't there, the clinics aren't there, they've closed down, and you suddenly have to scramble to put more and more community testing sites into play, or you have to go to pharmacies, which let's face it, the big corporate pharmacies are not necessarily people's favorite places in their neighborhoods for a variety of reasons. And that is really, it's the disinvestment of public resources. And then suddenly you have to recreate the wheel when the pandemic happens to try to flood public resources and because, oh, oh no. And, and part of it, Corey, you know, to ask, answer the question you got earlier, and I, this is what I feel particularly complicit in and, and angry about as a white person, it's oh no, not because suddenly white politicians and white people have gotten a conscience, but oh no, because we get scared that maybe what's going on in those communities is no longer something that we can compartmentalize and segregate and exclude from ourselves. And that that if anything, maybe there's a silver lining about COVID-19. Some people are finally realizing how interdependent we are. And the only reason I worry about saying this is instrumentalizes black lives in a way I don't like and Latinx lives I don't like. We should not be waiting until threats to black lives also threaten white lives to make these investments. And so while I appreciate people saying, oh, the great thing about COVID-19 is that it shows us we're interdependent and that we all depend on each other, it's like, but you're, you're instrumentalizing the lives of black people and other people of color when you say that. And we need to be very careful about that, that reasoning. And this is for me where the arguments about reparations and, and other forms of, of, of repair and, and addressing these historical issues come in. So I'll stop sharing. I promise to shut up and I really will this time. No, this is, this is great. I mean, the people are really responding to it. Folks that haven't responded or you think you're going to have questions, now's the time for you to kind of process your thoughts and all of the information that you've uh, heard and ask any clarifying questions. If you have uh, questions that, that build on the information that uh, Reggie and Josh have shared, go in the chat and ask those questions right now. My colleague Marjorie Yoshida is monitoring the chat and the Q&A and um, her voice is going to come live for us pretty uh, soon here. She's going to uh, ask your questions for you, so go in the chat. Now this is the, this is the moment where I kind of want to bring back <clears throat> the mission of race bridge and why we're having these conversations is a little bit of a soapbox for me. So forgive me, but I just want to make this connection for people. We're having these conversations because for years, um, and Reggie and I worked at the Black Holocaust, America's Black Holocaust Museum, and it was our job to have conversations, difficult conversations about race and facilitate those conversations, lead those conversations, and um, if people were coming through the museum, most often they were ready to have those conversations. Not always, but often, because we created an environment and a space that was non-threatening for people to ask questions and process information and really understand. That's the same spirit with which we're doing Race Bridge. This is the information that we're sharing because we want you to understand the way that segregation actually happened in Milwaukee, how it persists, and how it continues to affect the way that we interact with each other. I have gone to so many restaurants where I am the only black person, and people turn around and look at me like a giraffe walked through the door. People are so uncomfortable with each other. And you can try to get used to it, and you can try to ignore it, and but the fact of the matter is, this is affecting all of us, whether or not you live in an impoverished neighborhood, and you're affected by the roots of segregation or whether you're out in the burbs, how we interact with each other is just the through line in the conversations we have, the friends that we have, the way we raise our kids, our education, and it just matters. It matters and it shouldn't have to, uh, like Josh said, it shouldn't have to be one of the things where, oh, it starts to matter to you once it's starting to come into your neighborhood because you can't stop the, the, the cough in the, in the air and the particles from coming into the suburbs. This is true of every element and everything that people of color, color struggle with in Milwaukee. And for years, in the United States, for years, people have denied it and pretended like this is not happening. You know that it's happening. And this is an opportunity to put facts in front of you so you can combine your heart and mind together. 
That is the only way that we're going to start to change this. And I'm so passionate about having these conversations and so excited that so many of you want to have these conversations because we're going to be the ones that are writing the letters, sending the emails, going back to the workplaces, having the conversations, doing the pushback based on everything that we're learning with experts like the ones that we have here. So keep, keep putting your questions in the chat. Um, Josh and Reggie, somebody just asked a question. With everything that we know now, in your opinion, what is the way that we start to undo what has been done through segregation? What are some of the, the steps, the methods, the best practices? What do we need to be focusing on? Well, you know, I always answer this in the same way. It's a very simple thing to do, but it's exceptionally difficult to do it. And all it is is this. Listen, when you learn how white people got to where they are today, you study American history, you find out all of the times that white people got the straight hookup from the federal, state, local governments with investing in them becoming homeowners over decades and preventing people of color from having those opportunities, them investing in building the suburbs for white people so they could leave the central city. It isn't just like they, the suburbs just created themselves, right? They built the suburbs for white people to live in all white spaces. They invested money that they took from central cities into building the freeways you know, they destroyed the black business district on Bronzeville Street, not with the freeway, as everybody told me my entire life. Urban Renewal Project in 1957 destroyed the Bronzeville Business District, and then the freeway came later. But this is what I say. Do what you've done for white people, for people of color. Invest in their communities, invest in job creation, invest in their schools. Do all the stuff you've done for white people for the last 100 years. Now, people will say, well, oh, that's discriminatory. We can't do that. Because when you were doing it for white people, white people didn't have a problem with it. But then when you turn around and say, we should do this for black people, we should do this for Latinx people, Native American people, then all of a sudden, oh, it's a racial thing. Well, it wasn't a racial thing when you were hooking white people up and denying people of color. Do the same thing you did for white people for 100 years for people of color for the next 100 years, but accelerate it and do it in 10 years instead. And you'll see the shift. Josh? So I, here I'm gonna, I'm gonna fly my political flag a little bit and, and, and this, may, this may rub some people the wrong way and I realize it, but uh, I, I, everything Reggie just said, first of all, I wanna say I, I agree with. I think the community part of it and the collective part of it is huge for me. I think what we have seen in this country from its creation is what sociologists, historians, political scientists call racial capitalism. And it's not just that we have, we've only invested in white people, it's that we have used people of color from the earliest days of this country up until today as sources of wealth. And we have never acknowledged that, and we have never made that right, and we still don't have a situation in which people of color are given their due, given their value as people. For my money, so to speak, what has to happen is, and, and, and this is where it gets a little controversial because I know people of color are trying to climb that ladder just like white people did and people of color have aspirations to become wealthy, but I am in the camp that says everything Reggie just said, but right up to the point where we start talking about creating this sort of concentration of wealth among any group as we have today in the country. And that I think would be repeating the mistake. The, 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 the one part of that I guess I would compliment is we cannot not allow uh, our, our ideas, our American ideas of how this works to create a black billionaire class, for example, or a Latinx. Not that I think there's any real risk of this, but part and parcel of this for me has to be saying, going back to the white people and saying, not only did you get invested in, but to use the words of, of a, of a a quasi-famous person of color, black man in this country, you, you didn't build that by yourself, right? And it's time to come back and, and pay, pay the price of that. So it's not just that we're going to invest all of this in, in the communities that have been disinvested from and destroyed over time. We're going to find that investment in all of the misinvestment and basically stolen wealth. And, and it, it's time. We're, we're coming and we're gonna work with you. No one's gonna lose their home because of this. Like people hear reparations and they think, oh, they're gonna come take my house away. That, that's ridiculous. No one's talking about that. People are talking about creating a system that's fair in which property of all sorts, whether it's a house, whether it's a business, whether it's intellectual property 
is treated fairly and seen collectively as a resource, no one should have to go hungry or homeless or without an education. No one should show up in a hospital that doesn't have the equipment to help their newborn baby thrive in this country. We, have, we are the wealthiest country overall on the planet we can redistribute that wealth in a way. And, and here's where I, this is where I plow right back into what Reggie said. And when we do that, you are, pardon my French, damn straight it's gonna be disproportionately in the, in the communities that we have not only disinvested from, but we've destroyed. And that, that I think is, it makes people uncomfortable because it's radical. People start saying that sounds like socialism. I don't really care what you call it. I think we need a, a contract with everyone in this country that says, it is not okay to become obscenely wealthy. And let's face it, white people are well above and beyond the people who have become obscenely wealthy. And the advantage of this for my money is that it helps you build a coalition with other people who aren't people of color who are also not wealthy. Whether that's in Appalachia, whether that's in the Midwest, whether that's in the nearer West, whether that's on the Pacific, I don't care where it is. There are an awful lot of people we've left behind in this country too that are not people full of color. And that is for me where the opportunity is. Not that it shouldn't be, shouldn't be focused on communities of color, but that I, I believe there's a coalition willing to step up and say, yeah, because when you do that, we're going to get recognized too. Our history is going to get, we're all going to benefit from that. Marjorie, uh, are you seeing any questions that you want to, um, I know there's a lot of questions. <laughs> I gave you, you had a hard job today. <laughs> what do you see? I don't know if we're ever going to get to everything. Um, so going back to like uh, where we started with the restrictive and racial covenants, do these, it sounds like these still exist. They are still attached to almost all of those properties. So the, most of them were written on like subdivisions. Uh, the one that I showed you from South Milwaukee, uh, I showed that at a presentation, the mayor of South Milwaukee was there and he almost fell out of his chair. He couldn't believe it. <laughs> So he's been on my case for the last two years about Reggie, how can I get rid of it? How can I get yeah. rid of it? I'm like, dude, you, you have to go through a long process to get rid of those. They're, they're not legally binding anymore, but they're still okay. attached. You have to literally go through a process of removing it. And so what he's done, he's gotten the city attorney in South Milwaukee to begin the process of working to actually amend that. That's literally what you do. You just amend it and you take that language out of it because the covenants that language, the racial part, was only a small part of what the entire covenant covered. Because it would cover like things like the type of shrubbery you can have in front of your house, how far your fence has to be away from the sidewalk, stuff like that. And that little line in it, you know, you just go in and you amend it. That's what happened in, in Wauwatosa in Washington Highlands, which was the first community that wrote one. Over the course of time, they amended it and they took that language out of it. Uh, and I tell people, like, listen, I told the folks in Tulsa, listen, don't be upset about it. You can't go back and fix it, but use it as a teachable moment. And I told the mayor of South Milwaukee, use it as a teachable moment. Show people in South Milwaukee why your community is 89% white today, because it was 100% white years ago. So the covenants are still attached. If you own a home in Metro Milwaukee, you can go to the county assessor's office and ask if they can assist you in checking to see if you have a covenant attached to your home. A lot of people do, they just don't know it. Wow, very interesting. Um, as we see these examples of inequity, what are some best models or examples of cities that have made a change for the better? Do you know of any? I'll defer to Josh on this. So the, there are not a lot of, of great examples, unfortunately. This is, this is <laughs> uphill work. Uh, I think what we are slowly starting to see is grassroots level pressure that then translates. So I, I'm actually most familiar with Baltimore. I spent a lot of time there in terms of the work that's been going on. And one of the things that is slowly starting to take root in Baltimore, although there's a lot of, there's a lot of issues that are going on there still, but especially in the aftermath of, of Freddie Gray, uh, black leaders in the community who are then young and, and there's a great article about how, how the protests in the aftermath uh, of, of, of everything. What, what to pick out, but you know, specifically the the latest uh, the latest problems uh, of policing here were much different than the post Freddie Gray protests. And part of the reason for that is a black, a young black leadership came to the fore in Baltimore, 
and has honestly displaced both the white older leadership and the, and the older black leadership. And is one of the things they have really started to do is implement local policies, like really pushing community land trusts, really pushing green space. And what this does is uh, start to build investment in black neighborhoods, start to build investment in black businesses, and really start to rethink some of the development apparatuses and the educational apparatuses that we use to fund these things and start to challenge them. Um, and, and that, I, I, you know, Baltimore's still got a long way to go, but I'm actually optimistic in many ways about Baltimore uh, because of the way that this, this group of young Black leaders, uh, both in, in elected office, but also in NGOs and civil society, have come, have come to the fore. Uh, if you went back 10 years ago, you'd find those people being cursed by the political establishment, whether Black or white, they had an uphill fight. And what they did was organize, they built power. And now they are the mayor. Now they are city council people. Now they are the leaders of organizations that wield real power. For, for people who are not those leaders, voting, choosing the organizations you support carefully. If you really listen to what I said and you went into the chat and you said, hell yeah, that's right. Think about all of the organizations that you support and which ones are really committed to changing the status quo and which ones would like to maybe tinker within the status quo, but are largely okay with the status quo because they're doing okay. They've gotten theirs and this is not just black or white or Latinx or Asian, it's everybody that is a temptation. And so that, for me, that's the hard work is, is if you've started to get yours, good for you, but also start thinking, how do I change, who do I invest in? What do I invest in? And that's one of the reasons I was so excited to, to get invited to do this is because I see this as one of those steps, like participating in this stuff and then going back out and saying to friends, to family, this is what's going on. And then organizing, talking to neighbors, going door to door, figuring out electorally, but also in terms of investment. So, you know, in New York City and in other places, you see things like rent control, you see things like affordable housing legislation coming on, you see reform to education systems, and you think, oh, that's great legislation. We should do that in Milwaukee. We should do that in Madison. What you don't see is the 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 years of overwhelmingly people of color organizing to get to the point where not only the people voting on it were amenable to voting on it, but that the people writing it up and supporting it were, were in a large enough in number to convince those politicians they had insulation. I, for, all the, for all the garbage New York City gets about, and, and a lot of it deservedly so, New York City has actually done a pretty good job. And, and, and there's, there's evidence on this. New York City is number one in the country right now for the life expectancy after the age of 40 for the people in the bottom quintile of income. Raj Chetty, an economist at Harvard, just put together a health inequality project, and I can send the website out. I'm not going to share the screen again. But Milwaukee is 75th out of the top 100 cities on that list. Madison's 53rd. Rich, progressive, white Madison, 53rd, because we don't treat people who don't make much money well, and we don't invest in them. We don't. And in this country, for all the reasons we just laid out, people of color are more likely on average to not have that money, not have that wealth because we've disinvested from them, taken away from them and destroyed their neighborhoods. So that, for me, that's the answer. Whenever you see a city, and again, I, I actually think for all the New York City stigma of it's an elite playground, and there's a lot of truth to that. New York City has also, because of public transportation, because of the other things they've tried to do, been able to invest back in that. And, and those are the, I, I'm not saying become like New York City, but those are the examples we should be borrowing is public investment works. Sorry to go on long about that. I get, I get worked up about this stuff. I, lo I love it when, when that question comes through and it's like, I've been thinking about this and reading about this and researching. It's perfect. Reggie, I have a question uh, really quickly for you. Yeah. Uh, the hyper segregation in Milwaukee, when we did our um, the live event, it was like a couple years, two or three years ago now that you uh, came and spoke for, uh, few members. The, you answered a question about, I think maybe even I asked the question and somebody just asked it. What is the difference between Milwaukee and other cities? Like, why are we hyper segregated? And I think you had made mention of like the timing of when the black population came to Milwaukee or uh, can you speak to that a little bit? Like, why are we so different? If all, if all yeah. the cities have done these restrictive covenants, why did it hit so hard in Milwaukee? 
Well, look, I think there's a couple things. Number one is that most people, when they think about segregation, they think about cities, but segregation is generally measured by metropolitan statistical areas. So when you look, what I showed you earlier was the Milwaukee metro area, the four county area, and Blacks are concentrated and Latinos are concentrated in certain parts, right? So that's one piece. And what the other piece I showed, which is the lack of Black people in the suburbs in Milwaukee County. If that's not a clear enough example of why Milwaukee is so different than other places, there's nothing else that can explain it. And one of the things that, that, that really makes Milwaukee different from Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Buffalo, is that Black people came to Milwaukee at a much later date during the Great Migration than they did to these other cities, right? So during the early years of the Great Migration, people came to Chicago and they went to Detroit, and they went to Cleveland, they went to New York, they went to all these different places. They didn't come to Milwaukee. The Black population of Milwaukee in 1940 was, was um, what, less than 9,000 people. That grew to 21,000 by 1950, 62,000 by 1960, 105,000 by 1970. So we came later. We didn't have a long time to build a strong black middle class in Milwaukee. And what would have assisted us was the Bronzeville Business District not being destroyed by the urban renewal program that destroyed half of the black owned businesses in Milwaukee. So what ends up happening, we came here uh, that we were so dependent on manufacturing jobs. In 1970, 43% of all Black people in Milwaukee worked in blue collar jobs, right? We came here because those were good jobs. And at the time in 1970, Blacks had the seventh highest median family income for Blacks in the country. Our poverty rate was 22% below the national average for Blacks. We were doing exceptionally well. But guess what? From 1963 to 2017, 92,000 manufacturing jobs disappeared in Milwaukee. 50,000 of them since 1982. So what, what ends up happening with us is that we were never able to build like that Hyde Park neighborhood Chicago has. We couldn't build one, right? It, it was a guy that I met that grew up in Detroit in a swanky black suburb of Detroit, lived in Chicago in Hyde Park, moved to Milwaukee and was like, dude, where is like the, 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 the neighborhood like Hyde Park in Milwaukee? I'm like, dude, there is not a neighborhood like that in Milwaukee. We don't have one. So Milwaukee is very different historically from those other places. And part of the reason Blacks didn't come in large numbers because they weren't offered jobs in Milwaukee. They didn't actively recruit Black people in Milwaukee in the early 1900s like they did in Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland. And you know why? Because in the early 1900s, Milwaukee was the, the most heavily foreign-born population of any city. It had a higher percentage of foreign-born residents than any other city in the country, even higher percentage than New York. Because guess what? They were inviting uh, ethnic Europeans who immigrated here to come to Milwaukee and work, and they wanted to keep those jobs for those people only, and they didn't invite Black people to, to work in those jobs. So Milwaukee's history is a little bit different than those other places, and that really impacted why segregation looks so different here. Okay, so I said I was, I promised I was only gonna keep you guys 10 minutes over. So we're gonna wrap up this portion. They're, they're pop, by popular demand, folks are asking for a part two. So, I mean, I don't know, I'm just saying, but uh, in the Q&A right now, guys, listen, if you're, we still got 230 participants with us, go in the chat and leave a love note for the panelists. Uh, let folks, let, let Josh and Reggie know how much you appreciate their contributions. And Reggie and uh, Josh, Tell uh, the participants two things. Folks are asking for your contact information. So if you want to drop whatever contact information you want to share in the chat. And then um, tell folks what you're working on, what they can look forward to uh, from you. Reggie, I know you got a great uh, podcast going and you, you got a brand new company. And we got lots of people uh, on this webinar who run HR departments or work closely with HR departments who need training and presentations. Mm -hmm. um, Josh, you got research going on. You got uh, projects going on. So tell tell the folks, Josh, tell, what are you working on right now that they can look forward to? So the project that I'm I'm most excited about, and you saw a couple maps from it, is I'm working with a graduate student, uh, UW Madison Sociology, Leah Foltman, uh, who's a, a woman of color herself, graduate student of color herself, uh, on a project to look at COVID nineteen. Uh, and do spatial analysis of it and, and make it historical. Look at the way that COVID-19 affects in Milwaukee and elsewhere, but, but we're starting with Milwaukee, have really mapped on literally and figuratively to what we've been seeing. But Lee is more interested even more broadly in the redlining uh, maps and, and sort of using that same approach. Someone asked in the chat about education and, and that's actually where she got her first start was thinking about schools and, and the way schools in Milwaukee and other places 
uh, have been affected by that historical legacy. And there's a, a, also a, a, an alum of the sociology department, Michelle Robinson, who now works for the state, who wrote a brilliant dissertation uh, on Milwaukee and Madison and education. So that's, that's my part of what I'm doing here, is, is trying to work with grad students and work myself uh, on, on looking at the history there and then bringing it up to date and combining it with other forms of data. My, my pipe dream is bringing together these redlining maps, not just with like racial dot maps where you pull the data from the government or wherever, but actually getting community organizations involved uh, so that there can be more community mapping. It's something that hasn't really happened with the redlining maps and that I'd like to see as a more pod positive spin. Too often those maps show neighborhoods that are still disinvested that are still, and, and what I'm hoping is that we are starting to see a change where the resources located in those neighborhoods can also be mapped. And we can start seeing how redlined neighborhoods have, have changed over time. And which, to, to get to some of the questions about where, where have places succeeded, where are examples where redlined and yellow lined areas were not bulldozed over by urban renewal, like they were in Milwaukee and Madison, uh, but have actually become maintained being communities of color, but have become more than what people might expect from seeing those maps. So that's, that's the project. All right, Reggie. Yeah, well, you know, uh, right now, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna just put um, the information about my column. So I'm, I'm, I'm part of a podcast with Tariq Moody um, at uh, 88.9, it's called By Every Measure. So it's a five-part podcast. The first two episodes are available online. Uh, first episode was about systemic racism. The second one was about, um, you know, looking at policing. We're going to talk about, you know, wealth inequality. We're going to talk about health inequality, things of that nature. So that, that's one place you can kind of hear me talk. You can read my column at MilwaukeeIndependent. Uh, dot com. Uh, just go to Milwaukee Independent, type my name in, and you'll be able to see the columns that I've been writing there since back in 2016. You can also go to my website, which I put into the chat at nurturingdiversity.us. Uh, you can kind of see the, the programs that we offer, um, learn a little bit more about what we do as a company. Uh, and, you know, I'm on Facebook. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an old dude. I'm on Facebook. I have an Instagram account. I think I posted the Instagram one time because, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not in that space. Uh, I'm on Twitter at ABHM Reggie, uh, but I think I never really used Twitter either. So if you want to follow Reggie, you got to do the old man route and look me up on Facebook. Um, that's why I post links to all of my articles. Uh, I just recently wrote an article for U.S. News and World Report, which came out, was published yesterday, in fact. Uh, about the history of, of uh, anti-racism activism among black people in the state of Wisconsin. So I'm really happy that they reached out to me about that. Uh, but I, I tell people I'm, I'm the easiest dude in the world to reach. Uh, you, you can find me in a lot of different spaces. Uh, and somebody's wrote, Reggie, when you sleep. Uh, I don't know when I sleep. I don't know if I even sleep. I think I'm just like walking around doing work all the time. But you know, I, I'm really excited though about the opportunity to be here with your group. Uh, Corey Joe to connect with you to maintain our friendship and collaboration and man dude Josh I got to tell you brother I got a man crush on you Josh I gotta get likewise to likewise <laughs> it, it's, it's to more than you. reciprocated man <laughs> so you know we got to work together man I'm looking forward Absolutely. to it Absolutely. It's, meant, it's meant to be I want to have to thank both of you I hope <laughs> you had a chance to go in the chat and see all the love notes I will tell you this I knew that we were going to do this uh, segregation conversation um as part of race bridge. race bridge is technically over in in august but the mm -hmm. response has been so great so we kept doing it and i wanted to get that segregation one in and i knew i was gonna hound reggie until i could get on his calendar to do it and josh i literally i have an email what i sent to myself and it says segregation webinar reggie jackson and josh garoon you too you normally i have four or five people and probably two months ago, I envisioned us having this conversation. And I have to say, I have a crush on both of you too. You're so smart. It's so knowledgeable. I am so impressed with, um, as somebody said in the chat, the uh, easy and calm way you present really, you know, data intense and, and challenging information in a way that uh, is easy to, um, easy to process and think about. 
So, I mean, I'm just encouraging everyone who's still here to take the spirit of the knowledge that we're all getting and own it. It's yours and let it empower you and, and shape how you lead uh, at work and in your communities and, and every other, uh, every, every other way, really. I'm just so impressed. Um, I have to show this photo really quickly. Uh, let me see. Let me share. Let me share. This is a photo, Reggie, of my mom who passed away two years ago and Dr. Cameron. Oh, wow. And Reggie, we both spoke at Dr. Cameron's uh, funeral when he, he passed when he was 91. 92. He was June 11, 2006. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Uh, wow. Somebody sent me that. Uh, and I'm just so glad, uh, yeah. so glad to have it. But they're they're standing in the halls that that you and yeah. I stood in many, many, many oh, yeah. a day leading yeah, right in that, just like right this. in that front entrance to the museum. Yep. Oh, your mom was so beautiful on that picture too. Yeah. So many, so many years ago. I have to give a shout out to Spaces for those who don't know. MMAC is moving. Uh, to the avenue. So we're going to be in the space that used to be Grand Avenue, now called the Avenue. The space is beautiful. Um, that's going to be our new offices. So in the meantime, I don't have a home for my webinars and spaces stepped up and offered for MMAC staff and everyone doing webinars to come here. Um, this space is amazing. It's really beautiful. So I want to thank them uh, for the opportunity to um, sit on the, on the river and have this conversation in beautiful Milwaukee. Josh, uh, Reggie, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you uh, for your contributions and thank you for all that you're doing and what you'll continue to do. Thank you for having us, amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. And Josh, looking forward to uh, connecting with you soon. Corey, Joe, let, let's keep doing this. You know, if you wanna do a part two, I'm, I'm down for part two. I think I let's do it. I Josh think again. I'm in. You bet. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, everybody. You'll get the recording for this uh, tomorrow. We'll send it out, and then I'll make sure I put in uh, Reggie and Josh's uh, contact information and their social media handles. Uh, let's get those follows up. <laughs> I, I just sent Reggie a friend request while we were doing this. It's in your. Right, it's in your queue, man. All right. Thanks. Appreciate All right, it. Bye, everyone. Bye. Take All care. Right. Thanks Thank again. you, Marjorie. Thanks for your help. Take care. All right, y'all have a good evening. Be safe, everybody. Bye-bye.